please have a seat if you're here with us on site. Um, and also if you're standing at home worshiping in a posture of, in an upright position, please feel free to sit down. Just a, uh, oh, where are my notes? Hold on one minute. The notes are available at tinyurl.com slash O-C-C-E-C dash docs, D-O-C-S. And in there you'll find a outline of what we're covering. It should make it easier to follow along. We've, we're in chapter 19 of the book of Joshua. And just as a quick overview of what's going on, if, in case you're joining us midstream, Joshua 1 through 5 are about the preparations to enter into the promised land. And there's, if you remember, if I could be so blunt, uh, all the men were circumcised. And they even had, uh, they put all the foreskins into what was called a, a hill of foreskins. There was a renewal of the covenant between their, God's people and God. And they prepared themselves. That's probably the worst thing to do before you go into battle get circumcised because it's very painful uh, doesn't really do much for the morale <laughs> right then in chapter 6 to 12 we find the battles actually taking place the battles of Jericho the battle of Ai etc and we found that God God did the battling the Israelites were there just to follow through and we learned one big lesson there that the battle belongs to the Lord the battle belongs to the Lord. He does all the heavy lifting. And then starting from chapter 13, we began the possession stage. Um, there are a whole bunch of lessons that we've learned. Chapter 13, don't settle for what the world offers because two and a half tribes settled to the east of the Jordan River. And that was not the promised land. They saw that the land was so green. They thought it was good, but it was actually bad militarily because they were the first to always get invaded. They were always devastated by, they were the first to be exiled. So it was Reuben, Gad, and half of the tribe of Manasseh. And um, let's see, so uh, let me just go through there real quick. We learned, so we learned about the two and a half tribes. We learned about Caleb, 85 year old Caleb. And he was, he said, I'm just as strong now as I was 40, 45 years ago which is really amazing. He was ready to go into more battles as this octogenarian, this 80-year-old, um, which is really inspiring to me. I hope that when I retire, I'm still able to, to help people possess their inheritance. And um, one thing to note, he was not an Israelite, but he was given a portion of the promised land. And that means God is willing to open up his covenant to all those who call upon his name. Even the Moabites who tricked Israel, they became enfolded into the people of Israel as well. Hmm. Uh, Roland talked about possessing our inheritance by having the right attitude, breaking the box of unbelief, and having courage to stand. That was in chapters 15 through 17. Good lessons there. And then chapter 18, we learned the key to dynamic life, not getting dry. What is it? corporate worship, corporate worship. And not merely on Zoom, not merely on a flat screen, but church, by God's definition, is the physical gathering of his people to worship him. So we need to make worship, corporate worship, central and regular in our daily lives, not just for Christmas and Easter, but every, once a week to, to set that day as uh, holy, set it apart. Uh, we also learned that uh, we need to possess our inheritance. So, yes, God did do the battle, battles. He did the heavy liftings. But the people were instructed to go possess the land. Not, even though they did warfare and Israel won every major battle, there were still people within the cities that needed to be possessed. And that was God's instruction. Um, some of the seven tribes did not go and possess their cities. And so 
they were told, they were rebuked by Joshua. They said, hey, you need to go and take, take your inheritance. And so he dealt with these seven tribes. They sent out three surveyors each. They mapped it out. Okay. Today, we are at the end of the possession stage. We're at the end of the d- distribution of the promised land. We're going to finish this section. Next section is about actually living in the promised land. I, I know I changed the chapters by one, but, but I just wanted to complete this distribution stage. Last week, we talked about the seven tribes that did not possess their land. We dealt with one of them, Benjamin, remember? So we have, oh, okay. So we have six tribes left. Let me share this quick illustration. An American tourist wrote about visiting a Polish rabbi named Hofetz Chaim, and I, I don't claim to be a Hebrew expert, so I hope I didn't butcher it too bad. Hofetz Chaim. And when he walked into this very renowned Polish rabbi's home, he thought it would be pretty nice. He thought that the, the, you know, the synod, the temple would support him very generously, but he was surprised to see that his home consisted only of one room. That one room was his kitchen, his dining room, his bedroom, everything. And it basically consisted of books, a small table, and an old chair. That's all. That's all. And so this American tourist said, wait a minute, you're Rabbi Chaim, you're so famous. Uh, Where's your furniture? And the rabbi replied, well, where's your furniture? (laughs) And the American tourist said, my furniture? What do you mean? I mean, I'm I'm your guest. I'm a visitor here. I'm only passing through. And Rabbi Hofetz Chaim said, so am I. Do you understand? No? Let Let me connect the dots for us. The past few weeks, we've been talking about the Israelites possessing the promised land. But what does that mean for us? It means that we are on this journey, this wilderness of 40, 80, maybe more years. We are in this wilderness, and God gives us an inheritance. And we're supposed to live in this wilderness as if we're only passing through so that our ultimate destination, our ultimate goal is to possess, to take possession of the inheritance God has promised to us. Now the problem is we like to go through the wilderness, which should be a two-week journey. It took 40 years for the Israelites because they kept not learning their lessons. And so we need to learn our lessons. We need to deal with the sin in our lives to prepare ourselves to take possession of the inheritance Jesus Christ has prepared for us. So before Chris comes up to read Joshua 19, and by the way, he's only going to read select verses. He's not going to read over all the Hebrew foreign-sounding names. Let's pray. Join me in prayer. Father, thank you that you love us so much. Thank you for the brothers and sisters gathered here. Thank you for the brothers and sisters gathered over live stream. They've taken time out of this Christian Sabbath, this Lord's Day, to invest in worshiping you. Please teach us what the promised land is. Teach us what our inheritance truly is. And just as importantly, please teach us how to possess it, how to dispossess those who don't belong there and to possess what you've promised to us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Today's passage comes from Joshua 19. Please take a moment to grab your Bibles. Joshua chapter 19. The second lot came out for Simeon, for the tribe of the people of Simeon, according to their clans, And their inheritance was in the midst of the inheritance of the people of Judah. The inheritance of the people of Simeon formed part of the territory of the people of Judah because the portion of the people of Judah was too large for them. So the people of Simeon obtained an inheritance in the midst of their inheritance. 
The third lot came up for the people of Zebulun, according to their clans. And the fourth lot came out for Issachar, for the people of Issachar, according to their clans. The fifth lot came out for the tribe of the people of Asher, according to their clans. And the sixth lot came out for the people of Naphtali, for the people of Naphtali, and according to their clans. The seventh lot came out for the tribe of the people of Dan, according to their clans. And when they had finished distributing the several territories of the land as inheritance, the people of Israel gave an inheritance among them to Joshua, the son of Nun. By the command of the Lord, they gave him the city that he had asked, Tinnasera, in the hill country of Ephraim. And he rebuilt the city and settled it. These are the inheritance of Eleazar, the priest, and Joshua, the son of Nun, and the heads of the fathers' house of the tribes of the people of Israel, distributed by lot as Shiloh before the Lord, at the entrance of the tent of meeting. So they have finished dividing the land. This is the holy and inerrant word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Chris. So they finished dividing the land. Wow. Today we have three more lessons on how to possess our inheritance. But before we get to the lessons, I'd like for us to briefly cover the text of the six remaining tribes. So far, Two and a half tribes have possessed their land east of the Jordan. Remember that? Reuben, Gad, and half of Manasseh. All right, no, we, we, so these are, um, when I say half of Manasseh, remember Manasseh and Ephraim are two of Joseph's sons. Joseph's portion has been given a double portion. And half of Manasseh is right there, represented there. Okay? And here they are on, on the map. They are to the east of the Jordan River. They did not make it into the promised land. And instead they settled. Now three and a half tribes have had their inheritance apportioned to them already. Judah, Ephraim, the other half of Manasseh, Benjamin, as well as a totally separate portion given to Caleb. All right, it's not listed. He's not one of the tribes. He's not an Israelite but he's accepted as God's covenant people. And again, as I said earlier, from Caleb we learn to passionately serve God wherever and whenever. He was assigned to the hill country where there were still giants living. The people of Israel were not very big because they were poorly fed. They, they were slaves for several hundred years. They lived in the wilderness. So the people they met, they considered giants because they were well fed. That's a good lesson to learn. So those are the uh, tribes that have been covered already. Two and a half plus three and a half, six tribes already. Uh, Levi's included in there. And in chapter 19, that's today, we cover the remaining six tribes along with Levi, which has been spread throughout Israel. That's representative of God's presence spread out among His people. The people of Levi did not get their own possession. They were spread out. Now, the last seven tribes, they dilly-dallied. They didn't obey God immediately. But after Joshua rebuked them, thankfully, they obeyed. They surveyed the land. Each tribe sent out three surveyors. They surveyed it out, and they possessed the land. They brought all this information back to Joshua and Eliezer, the priest, and they apportioned these lands by lot. So I uh, just want to... The first lot fell to Benjamin. That was in the last chapter. Remember the tribe of the wolf? The fierce, passionate warriors. We come to the ni chapter 19, verse 1, and we find that we're dealing with a very, very small tribe called Simeon. It says, a second lot came out for Simeon, for the tribe of the people of Simeon. Now, if you notice in verse 9, I had Chris especially read verse 9. It says, the inheritance of the people of Simeon form part of the territory of the people of Judah. Why? Because the portion of the people of Judah was too large for them. The people of Simeon obtained an inheritance in the midst of their inheritance. So to help you visualize this, I've put out the map, and you see Judah is quite a large area. 
Judah, as you remember, was the royal tribe. That's the tribe from which King David would come from. That's the tribe from which Jesus would eventually arrive from. And Simeon is smack dab in the middle. Well, why, why was Simeon's inheritance within the border of Judah? Okay? It, it's, it's interesting. It's the same reason why Benjamin, one of the smallest tribes, is surrounded by all the other tribes. Okay, it's related. It's a little bit obliquely related. It's, remember it says in verse 9 that the portion of Judah was too much for them. And so God said, Simeon, your tribe will be in the middle of Judah. And that app has an application for us. It's not listed for you, but please do write it down. In other words, those of us who are blessed with abundance, we must, actually it is there, we are to care for and to protect those who are weak, those who have less. All right? I'm going to come back to that a little bit later. When God entrusts us with plenty, with abundance, we are called to accept the lowly and to bless them with with our abundance. Now, some of you are saying, well, I'm not that rich. Yes, you are. If you live in Irvine, you are richer than 90% of the world already. If you have hot water, you're living better than 50% of the world. If you have electricity, you're living better than 75% of the world. The majority of the world does not have running hot water and electricity, if you didn't know that. Okay, so, but I drive this really old 2001 car. You have a car. Many people in this world don't have a car. They have to walk miles to get to work or to school. So one application, of the, I'll get to the applications later. I just want us to see that Simeon was placed in the middle of the tribe of Judah. And there is a, an application for us there. The principle of God says you have an abundance, so provide for those who have less. So Simeon was the second lot of the seven. The third lot came up for the people of Zebulun, according to their clans, it says in verse 10. See how we're skipping over a lot of the Hebrew names because we can't pronounce them and we're not sure exactly where some of these locations are. It says the territory of their inheritance reached as far as Sarid. Now that place is, is speculated upon. Who is Zebulun? We don't really talk about who these tribes are that much, so allow me this brief moment to share. Zebulun was the youngest son of Le Leah and Jacob. Okay? Number 12. And his name has its origins in the words for gift and honor. Z Zebulun was the younger brother of Issachar. But as God often does, he reverses the order. He reverses the birth order. Remember Esau and Jacob? Who was older? That's right, Esau was older. Yet who received the blessing? Jacob did. God favored Jacob. Joseph was one of the youngest, but God elevated him to be the tribe from which David and Jesus would come from. And so we have here this, this principle, which I have not listed, but it's for your own extra extra credit, so to speak. God doesn't judge by the way of the world. It's not first come, first serve. God often selects the weakest to show His power. God often selects those who are meek and humble to reveal His truth. Now, what does this uh, reversing of the order show favor? I, th I think I just explained it. God is no respecter of physical merit. He does not respect worldly measurement. I was texting last night with a brother, and he was talking about watching, um, I forget the name of the movie, oh, Yesterday, movies Yesterday. And it's a movie about, you know, it's a silly premise, but something happens, and it's as if the Beatles, the, the band, the Beatles, never existed, all right? so. It's a, it's a side note. But, but this brother was talking, was chatting with me over text, and he was saying, oh, you know, I, I'm not sure I get it about John Lennon because 
you know, he lived, yeah, but he wasn't ex as successful. And we had a, I think we had a pretty good, it made me think too, I really appreciated that, that perspective. It made me think, what is God's definition of success? Was John Lennon really that successful? He, yeah, he, in terms of music and money, yeah, but he died early. And did he really make an impact on people's lives? Well, some people will say, yeah, but in terms of lasting impact, I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure. I think other people, I think other people who've discipled others, brought people to Christ, I think they have a greater impact because they helped souls which were heading in the direction of hell to be introduced to Jesus Christ, to hear the gospel of Jesus and to be saved from the grips of hell itself. I think that is the definition of success. To use your talents, whether it be in music, literature, writing, whether it be in politics or medicine or in the arts, to use these gifts not to get famous, which is the world's definition of success, but to, but to advance the kingdom of God. That is eternal success. Whether it's helping a brother or sister get out of sin and darkness, whether it's to help someone to, to be introduced to Jesus, that's infinitely more important than being known by millions and millions of people, but not really changing their eternal destination one iota. And so this is God at work. He says, Zebulun, you're the least, you're the last one, but I'm going to portion you, your land, your inheritance before your older brother Issachar. Man looks at outward appearance. I'm sure you're familiar with that verse, um, that passage where Samuel's looking for the first king, right? And he's, oh, how about this guy? He's so, he's so handsome and tall and strong. God says, man looks at outward appearance like birth order, but God looks at the heart. Okay? The fourth lot came out for Issachar, for the people of Issachar according to their clans. Now, he was the fifth son of Leah, he was older than Zebulun. He's the ninth son of Jacob. His, me, his name means divine reward. See, Leah did not feel loved by Jacob. She was always in competition with her sister, her younger sister, Rachel. So she had all these sons for Jacob. She even had her handmaidens bear sons for Jacob in hopes that Jacob would show her some kindness, some generosity but he always favored Jacob. So she, every time she had a son, she was hopeful. This time I will be blessed, right? This is my honor. Six sons, right? Rachel can't even come close to beating me. She only has two. But alas, no. So there's Issachar's land right there, uh, right below Zebulun, just above West Manassas. And then verse 24, you see how quickly we're going here. The fifth lot came out for the tribe of the people of Asher, according to their clans. The fifth lot. You see how fast we're going here? And I, I want us to understand this land. If you take a look at the map here, Asher, its west border is the Mediterranean Sea. That is the most expensive real estate in, in the Israel, in the, in the promised land today. It was supposed to extend even further north, all the way up to Lebanon. But Asher did not complete its mission to possess the lands. Now, that's really important. We need to possess our inheritance before we enter into heaven. I need to make my case, but I'll, I'll get to it, okay? So think about prime real estate. Imagine that you owned all the beachfront property from, let's say, Long Beach down to Newport. Okay, that's, that's 50 miles. That's how small Israel is, by the way. It should actually be a lot longer. It should be about 125 miles up north. But they did not finish. But imagine all that prime real estate. Sea, sea coast route all the way from... Just, you know, it's, it's just really expensive. It's the top destination for resorts, for tourism. 
Wouldn't you like to have that? Asher, uh, at some point, was known as the breadbasket of Israel because it was so fertile. It was so um, abundant. And unfortunately, they did not finish their possession of God's inheritance. The sixth lot came out for the people of Naphtali, for the people of Naphtali, according to their clans. And verse 35 speaks about 16 fortified cities. And these 16 fortified cities is an archetype for us. You see, when I talk, I'm getting ahead of myself. But when God says that this wilderness and the possession of the promised land is a symbol for us, what it's referring to is our, the wilderness is our earthly life. And the promised land is actually possessing, possessing it. And I'll give you verses to support this. The promised land is actually heaven. Now there's some debate about this. Some people think it's entering a victorious Christian life here on earth, which is possible. But I think it's also very, very likely that it's actually entering heaven because that is our inheritance. Now the the challenge we have here on earth is we have a lot of fortified cities in our hearts. What, do you, what would you guess those fortified cities are? Anyone? It's so nice to have people here. Oh, by the way, are, is Min and Kelly? Oh, okay, not Kelly, but Naya. Okay, they're in the nursery. Yeah, nice. Anyone want to take a guess? What, is a fortif- what are some possibilities for the meaning of fortified cities? Is that pride? Yes. Yes. Definitely. Most definitely. Do you see the parallel now? You're starting to see the parallel? What else could it be? I'm not fishing for one specific answer, but you're on the right track. Safety, safety okay. We, we desire safety. Yeah. Fortified cities. Yeah. Sin. Yes. To the man going to medical school. <laughs> Yes. Fortified cities represents these, just like Chris Bang said, they are fortified, so they're hard to penetrate. Okay, they are, they are these places in our hearts that are secure. And just like Wes said earlier, one of the fortified cities is our pride. We don't want to let go of that pride. But what does God tell us to do before we enter the promised land? He says in order to enter the promised land, you've got to dispossess what's already there, and you've got to possess it in order to dwell there. So that's the, symbolize, so that's the symbol of possession. Do you understand? I hope it gets a little bit clearer. And this tribe is quite amazing because they are given the task, a kind of hard task, There are 16 fortified cities that have not been fully possessed yet. Now the battle has been won. The big wars have been fought. The warriors have been all killed. But then the the cities are still full of people. So picture this great conquest by the power of God. Victory over 16 fortified cities. One thing that... Life Fellowship is studying. We're going through the book of Revelation, and it's been so, so rich. Oh, my goodness. I've, I've been learning a lot. I've read through Revelation many times, but just going through it verse by verse, taking our time to study it, it's really, really quite amazing. And a common recurring theme, right? My lifers who are here today, a common recurring theme is that we are overcomers. We are conquerors in Christ. What do we conquer? Sin. It's the same ideas, but given in different verbiage. The battle belongs to the Lord. Another passage, we are more than conquerors. So many of these cities were conquered by Joshua, but many still had to be driven out. And that's Naphtali. And the seventh lot, we're here at the very last tribe now. The seventh lot came out for the tribe of the people of Dan, according to their clans. Yes. Dan's inheritance included 
the port of Joppa. Does that ring a bell to anyone? Joppa. Anyone? Star Wars? Joppa the Hutt. <laughs> okay, that works. Joppa the Hutt. Anyone remember an Old Testament prophet told to go somewhere and he left at a port city? Went the opposite direction? Jonah, that's right, Jonah. He left at the port of Joppa. All right. Now, if you look at the, if you look at the tribe of Dan's inheritance, he has the same issue that Asher has. Asher did not go all the way up and possess the inherited land. The tribe of Dan, unfortunately, did also did not go all the way up. They were supposed to possess more of the coastal land, prime real estate, like Malibu, right? Newport Beach, Laguna. Unpossessed. Unpossessed. And so this serves as a warning to us. We have to be on guard against settling halfway. You don't want to be called up to glory without having to deal with some of these fortified sins in your life. We have to complete what God has called us to do. So the, one of the questions we have to ask is, do you know your sins? Do you know your familiar sins? Do you know your fortified sins? Are you targeting them? Are you looking for effective books by, by powerful Christian pastors and authors teaching us how to deal with these sins? Are you enjoying victory over them? Do you possess the complete fruit of the Spirit? As a younger man, I remember, I remember a number of my sins. Impatience, oh, anger, just a lot of different sins. And slowly over the years, he's been dealing with those sins. And so with my my kids, I'm quick to admit when I'm wrong now. I said, Dad, I don't know about that. I said, oh, show me. Oh, you're right. And I have to ask them for forgiveness. And that models to them humility. It models to them that they're not always right either. And so they're more willing to ask for forgiveness. So the question that begs to be asked, like for, for the tribes of Asher, the tribe of Dan, are you fully possessing your inheritance, the promised land? Or are you leaving certain fortified cities untouched? Are you not even naming them? Like, I don't want to even talk about, don't even mention that sin. Don't even mention that sin, right? Do you, do you possess, fully possess the complete fruit of the Spirit? I still have a ways to go. I'm not saying I'm all there, all right? Um, I'm, I'm grateful for family members and close friends who, who call me out. That's, that's one thing I really appreciate about a good friend I have. He's not afraid to just call me out on things and said, oh, yeah, you're right. I need to, I need to work on that. So that's the challenge that, that we're given through these 12 tribes of Israel. We're not finished, though. There's three verses left, 49, 50, and 51. It says, when they had finished distributing the several territories of the land as inheritances, the people of Israel gave an inheritance among them to Joshua, the son of Nun. And thank you, Chris, for pronouncing that correctly. That's verse 49. The Israelites were so grateful to Joshua, they said, hey, here's your land. You've led us for 40 years, and then another five or seven to help do these battles. We're going to give you some land. And so they inquired of the Lord, presumably, and by command of the Lord, they gave him the city that he asked for. Joshua asked for a place for a specific city. And it sounds very Lord of the Rings-like. Actually, Lord of the Rings takes many of its grammatical and linguistic cues from the Bible. Tim, Timnath Sarah. It's in the hill country of Ephraim. Now, why does he choose there? It's because Joshua, the son of Nun, is also an Ephraimite. Ephraimite. He's from the tribe of Ephraim. And so he takes this tribe and Archaeologists and scholars have discovered where it is, and they said, boy, that was, that's a, in a sorry 
plot of real estate. It's in the bad area of the town. If you're t no offense to anyone who lives there, but everyone who, who finds out I'm, I'm trying to look for a house in Orange County, they all say, oh, but don't, don't look in Santa Ana. Is that really? Is it that bad? It can't be that bad, right? Don't, don't live in Santa Ana. It's, it's, and I looked at the crime rate, and it's like all the crime rates are pretty low, and then Santa Ana's like, Whoo? It's like, oh, okay, <laughs> right? That's the place that Joshua selected. It was a wilderness. It was desolate. It's it's pretty bad area. How many of you ever driven up to Las Vegas? Raise your hand. Almost everyone. It, it, it's not a trick question. I'm not. It's okay if you drive to Las Vegas. It's okay. <laughs> All right. It's it, it's a legitimate vacation spot if you're doing the right things. Right. Well, when my family and I go there, the few times we go there. We always worship at this specific tiny Calvary Chapel. We love worshiping there because they preach the Word of God verse by verse. The worship's wonderful uh, in terms of keeping Christ at the center. But on the way to Las Vegas, that's kind of like Timnath Sarah. It's a bunch of desolate, you know, these little scrawny trees here, and it's just nothing. It's hot. There's no flowing river through the middle of it. And that's the place that Joshua says, if you're going to give me a place, I'd like this city, please. And what does it say that Joshua does with it? It says he rebuilt it and he settled in it. He rebuilt it. That's part of taking possession of the promised land. We need to rebuild what was lost. We need to take what was desolate and make it fruitful again. Not to destroy it more, not to wreak havoc on it more, but to steward it well. And that's what it means to possess the promised land. If you understand the promised land as being heaven, that's what it means. In order to, get it, in order to fully possess our inheritance in heaven, we need to get rid of the sin. And we need to start bearing good fruit here on earth and rebuilding for the glory of God. That's the lesson of the book of Joshua. And it ends, this, this whole distribution process ends in verse 51. These are the inheritances that Eleazar the priest and Joshua the son of Nun and the heads of the father's houses of all the different tribes of the people of Israel distributed by lot at Shiloh before the Lord. That's remember where the tabernacle was for many, many, many years before it moved to its permanent location in the temple in Jerusalem. So they finished dividing the land. Now, that's, this is quite a relief to Roland and to me. <laughs> because when we first set out to do the book of Joshua, we were looking at it it's like, oh my goodness, how are we going to preach chapters 13 to 19? Because it's like all these foreign names, all these places that are unrecognizable today. But thank God, each... At first, we're going to take like four chapters here, another four chapters, remember? We're going to take all these different, because we just want to get it done in one fell swoop, right? But as we went through, it's like, oh my goodness, there's a lot of good spiritual lessons just in that one chapter. There's a lot. And the next one, supposed to take three chapters. Oh, there's so many good, do you mind shifting yours? And Roland's a great voice. Yeah, no problem. Go ahead, go ahead. So just this one, chapter 19, we have some amazing spiritual applications. What are they? Okay, take a look here. I told you the first one. We are to care for and protect the weaker. We are to care for and protect those who have less. Oh, I forgot to mention, because that's Timnath Sarah in Ephraim. He chose, he chose a demolished city. He rebuilt it. That's what it means to take possession of your inheritance. Take what was desolate Rebuild it. Dispossess the sin. Build something beautiful. Instead of taking what's best, he takes what's least and builds it up. Okay, so this is the first one. Provide for those who are weaker. Provide for those who have less. You remember Simeon? Judah had an excess. It was too much for them. So what did God say? Okay, you're going to get this property right in the middle of Judah, the royal tribe. You are the, the, one of the least of tribes. You get this. And we also remember Benjamin. Where you're going to be right in the middle of all these tribes to protect you. 
because you are the smallest tribe, one of the smallest tribes. I'm sure we're all familiar with Matthew chapter 25, one of the three parables that Jesus says. Um, at the very end of the parable, the king says to them, truly I say to you, this is Matthew 25 verse 40, truly I say to you, as you did to one of the least of my brothers, you did to me. These are Jesus' words. These are Jesus' words. This is why our church is so generous in terms of giving. We support so many different missionaries, so many different mission organizations. We, we help feed the homeless. We partner with the OC Rescue Mission. I'm really hoping that bring, a, bring people to the Union Rescue Mission in LA, downtown LA on Skid Row. Hopefully coronavirus will be over. Um, but one way for all of us to participate this coming Christmas season is through Operation Christmas Child. I want to encourage everyone here who has come to on-site worship. When you exit, there are Operation Christmas Child shoe boxes available. Please take at least one. Honestly, I think every family could afford five, 10, 20, maybe even more easily. What do you do? You go to Big Lots or to some 99 cent store and you buy school supplies. You buy simple toys such as stuffed animals or, you know, um, deflated soccer balls or things like that. And you pack it either for a boy or for a girl and there are different age groups available. And then we'll bring it to the processing center in Fullerton where those of us who want to can go volunteer to process these shoe boxes. Now, what happens to these shoe boxes? I'm really I really want to promote this and push this this year because I'm hoping we can prepare hundreds of shoe boxes. Number one, it blesses children in poverty. These shoe boxes are sent to countries, third world countries many of them with no running water or no running electricity. And not only are they given to kids who just love these, there's so many hundreds and hundreds of testimonies about how the toys were perfectly matched and suited for the child. But in it is an invitation to attend a 12-week evangelism slash discipleship course at a local church. It's not just a freebie, it's an invitation to hear the gospel and to meet Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And there are even testimonies of children who grew up were able to come to the United States and to find the person who gave, their gave them their box and to thank them in person. You, it might have been just a couple bucks to you, but it changed my life. And some of these people have families now and they're Christians and they're productive members of God's kingdom. And so let's provide for the weaker Okay? Um, maybe there's someone in your fellowship who's not as wealthy. Provide for them. Buy a Costco gift card. Say, hey, God just put it on my heart. I just want to bless you. Or go to, it, and the one thing that I do is I have a, a stack of either in and out or McDonald gift cards. When I see a homeless person, I don't give them stuff they can exchange for cigarettes or alcohol. Give them the, just give them an in and out gift card, $5. They can have a decent meal. All right? That's the first application. Provide for the weaker. This is what believers do. We take care of one another. We protect each other. Those of us who have abundance provide for those who have less. The second is this powerful lesson, at least to me, okay, I admit it, maybe it's not powerful to you, but to me it's so powerful. We finished this distribution. The people of Israel have been waiting for about 400 years. 400 years. And it's finished. The 12 tribes are receiving their inheritance. God keeps His promises. Sometimes it's not when we want it. Sometimes it's not the way we want it. But He always keeps His promises. And we should never grow discouraged. Never. 
when we're battling a sin, we can call up upon the Lord and He will provide a way out. He will give us strength to overcome, to have victory, to mortify, to kill off that sin. God always keeps His promises. Never, ever doubt Him. When we're discouraged and we're, we're tempted to take the easy way out, it's like, ah, oh, I'll just settle to the east of the Jordan. Don't do that. You'll be missing out on your inheritance. Don't do that. I don't know what it means for Manasseh to be half in and half out. I don't know. I don't know what that means. I don't have that spiritual insight yet. Hopefully I can find out. Hopefully maybe Roland and I can figure out what it means. But call upon his promises. If you don't know what his promises are, you need to start reading them and you just need to start memorizing his promises. Because if you don't even know or memorize what his promises are, how can you count on them? You know, when you're applying for that job, when you're hoping for that godly man or woman to be your spouse, how can you count on the promises of God when you don't even know where they are, when you're just ignorant of them? Okay. And the third application is this. The inheritance we must possess is nothing other than heaven. It's heaven. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11, write this down, okay, because this will help you confirm this. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11, it says, In Him we have obtained an inheritance. Aha! There's that word, the promised land, right? God's people are promised God's inheritance. And in Ephesians 1.11, we are God's covenant people. We are promised an inheritance too. What is it? We've been predestined according to the purpose of Him who works all things according to the counsel of His will. And I'm going to skip a verse. It says, When you heard the word of the truth, the gospel of your salvation and believed in Him, you were sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit who was the guarantee of our inheritance. When do we acquire it? Until we acquire possession. Does that word sound familiar now? All right, it's purposely used. Until we acquire possession of it to the praise of His glory. When we went through the book of Philippians, we went through this very mysterious passage where it says, work out your salvation. Not work for it, but work it out. And that's this whole parallel with the wilderness. We need to work out our salvation. If you know your sin is pride, and here's a weird word, it behooves you, I urge you, if you know what your sin is, if you know what your sins are, be intentional. Start addressing them. If you know it's lack of compassion, read up on people who are very compassionate. If it's pride, read up on people who are very humble and emulate them, because you might need something more tangible than just these general commands, right? If it's stealing, uh, have I have, email me. I've got some good books for you to read of these changed lives for people who are thieves, who are tr transformed by the power of Christ. Our inheritance is inquired, we possess it when we reach the praise of His glory, and that glory is attained in heaven. All right? So don't settle. Don't settle for things on this side of, of heaven. There's an old story about a swan and a crane. We've got a swan and a crane here, okay? A beautiful swan alighted by the banks of the water in which a crane was kind of waiting about looking for snails to eat. And for a few moments, the crane viewed the swan in stupid wonder because the swan is really beautiful, right? And like, oh, wow, look at you. Where'd, you. where'd you come from? Cranes ask. And the swan said, I come from heaven. And the crane asked, oh, and where is this heaven? Heaven, said the swan, heaven? Have you never heard of heaven? And the beautiful bird began to describe the grandeur of this eternal city. 
She describes streets of gold, gates and walls made of precious materials, gemstones, the river of life, purest crystal flowing through the city, upon whose banks is a tree whose leaves shall be for the healing of the nations. Music, just heavenly music all over, just lifting everyone's spirits. And so in very eloquent terms, this swan tried to describe the beauty and the people and the surrounding ambiance of the other world. But the crane wasn't interested at all. Huh? What? And finally, after this long description, the crane asked, are there any snails there? <laughs> snails? Snails? No, but there's much, much better food than snails. Snails are gross and icky and gooey and bleh. You want to, right? You want to eat? And the crane said, oh, no snails? Fine. You can have your heaven. I just want my snails. You get what I'm talking about, right? It's kind of pretty, pretty simple. This simple story has a simple fable underlying it. How many times do we, as followers, as disciples of Jesus Christ, we know we're heaven-bound, we know we're heading to the promised land, we know we're supposed to dispossess these fortified cities in our hearts to prepare ourselves to enter heaven, and yet we say, oh, I'm going after that snail. No, I'm going to go after this snail. And we keep our heads down to the ground instead of looking at the author and finisher of our faith, Jesus Christ. How many people have deliberately turned from the love of the Father and learned too late that in order to reach a promised land, they need to dispossess these fortified cities, and instead they settle for snails? I pray and I hope that is not any one of us here nor viewing on live stream. Let me invite you to go to tinyurl.com slash OCCEC dash response. Please feel free to do so right now. tinyurl.com slash OCCEC dash response. Yes, correct. Okay, and then fill out the response slip there. Please fill out a prayer request if you have it. We will pray for you on Tuesday at corporate prayer meeting. It's a couple of specific ways you can reply. Check the letter A. If there's somebody weaker or the least of these in your life. Maybe it's someone off a freeway exit. Maybe it's someone at work. Maybe it's someone in your family. Maybe it's a fellow student. I don't know. A worker. And you're going to start caring and protecting them. Because that's what the people of God do. Check the letter B if you want to say, Thank you, Dad, for always faithfully delivering your promises. His promises are many, and they're abundant and generous to His people. Check the letter C. If you, want to find, if you want to start addressing these fortified cities in your life, you never really, you know about them. They're there. They flare up when you're upset, you're irritated. Nah, you know, and then it comes out, right? It's time to deal with those fortified cities. Will you intentionally address them? Or are you going to keep wandering around for another 40 years? Right? So please, if you have your own application, feel free to write it out. Um, I love to read personalized applications because it tells me you're really processing God's Word and His Spirit is speaking to you. So feel free to write your own personal application as well. Keep writing. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you for this chapter. Even though it's got a bunch of foreign names and places we're not familiar with, 
thank you that there is a richness of spiritual application for us. Teach us to protect the least of these. Encourage and strengthen us when we get discouraged and tempted. Help us remember that you always keep your promises. And Lord, help us to understand that if we really want to arrive and actualize our inheritance, we need to dispossess these fortresses of sin. Thank you that our promised land, our inheritance, is heaven, is living with you forever and ever. Bless brothers and sisters as they write out their application, as they check boxes, as they're being led by your spirit to take the next step in Jesus' name.